Hi everybody and big welcome to CDH TV with a Myra the Magnificent Deck Tech video. So she's a 4 CMC, 2 4 human performer legendary creature and an unset commander, but still legal in normal eternal formats like casual EDH and therefore also in CEDH. And she actually happens to be functional, which means that, yeah, we're making a video of her. Now, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may create an attraction by drawing a random card from your attraction deck, the Infinity Attraction theme park stuff. Then you can tap her and pay X. Exile target instant sorcery card with mana value X from your graveyard and choose an attraction you control that doesn't have a midway counter on it. Put a midway counter on it. Whenever you visit that attraction, copy the exile card. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. The finalized outcome of this is that you can sit and randomizely cast spells now and then. Now the rule says that you have to have 10 minimum attractions in your attraction deck. However, we want to have as many attractions as possible to increase the like extreme situation where you build an enormous industry and have a lot of spells imprinted on these attractions. We don't really care what they do. For example, we have the merry-go-around that will make our creatures unblockable. We don't really care about that. What we do care about is, is triggering merry-go with an instant of sorcery spell imprinted on it to get that value effect. So the best attractions for this deck is more or less the ones that have the highest amount of dice potential of actually happening. So for those that don't know, when at the start of your turn you roll a d6 and you look at the result of that number and as you can see on these attractions you have values. So if you hit the value of for example here spin ride 2, 3 and 6, by the way all attractions have the value of 6, so if you roll a 6 it's a critical hit and everything happens. But if you roll for example a 2, this one spin ride will trigger, you will visit this thing and you will trigger also if you have imprinted a spell, cast that spell. So the next step is to obviously include the best instances of sorceries that you could accidentally cast. And here we go, extra turn spells. Yeah, I have Nexus of Fate, that is not something you can actually imprint, but I did include it because this is a deck that really thin itself out pretty easily. However, we have Temporal Manipulation, we have Time Warp, and such. And yes, it does work because Myra can actually imprint Time Warp onto an attraction and whenever you roll that die result you get an extra turn. That is amazing. Here's a problem though, it's not infinite, it is randomly and not deterministic. Anything could happen. You could roll a die result that doesn't give you a turn forever. However, you are probably gonna get a few turns here and there if you imprint more extra turn spells on attractions with different numbers, your chance of getting that extra turn increases with every turn. So for example, let's say we have imprinted Time Warp onto, let's go Spin Ride, and another version of Time Warp, with a different name of course, onto Fairy Wheel. So now we have an extra turn spell on 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, but not 1. So the chance here of you taking an extra turn is pretty good, but it's not 100%, which means that you have to theoretically play it through, However, once you start to reach like 10 or more turns and it's not really deterministic, people usually say, okay, I concede, I scoop, you're gonna figure it out anyway down the line. Any CDH deck that basically takes four or three, maybe two turns might be enough, let's just go two turns in a row, usually wins the match. So don't worry about the part where you're not consistent, you will get there. And how we finish this off is with the classic Andul Bridge, Brain Freeze and Lion's Eye Diamond, guys. Now some of you might say that we're gonna mill ourselves out and then cause Fazas Oracle and win the match. No, we are not. You see, eventually you will reach a storm count that is so huge that you can mill out your opponents and then just cause your opponents to draw cards and kill them that way. But also, once you've milled out yourself completely, you have Nexus of Fate and now Nexus of Fate will give you infinite turns and here you win the match. I should point out that you don't really need Nexus of Fate, that's just something I'm including because extra turns are already good with the deck, but you could absolutely cut it. But we have some other really great cards in here. Bribery, search target points library for a creature card and put that card onto the battlefield under your control, 
then that player shuffles. So in theory, once you've milled yourself out, you can cast Bribery and take a Phasis Oracle and win the match that way. Or you simply have imprint this into one of your attractions and you get to sit there and get some value now and then from your opponent's decks and from here with your enormous value board state i mean this is a mid-range deck with the value town game plan you can steal creatures to go to beat town and win the match that way too but i also personally included the mono red dual caster mage and heat shimmer or twin flame two card combo that basically creates infinite two twos with hastes and wins the match. It's completely up to you if you want to include this package inside your deck. The cards are actually pretty decent, they are not great but they are decent, they are good on their own so it's a combo you could include if you prefer this kind of playstyle. Moving forward and leaving the combo package stuff, we have Ursa. Now all of the, the attractions that we are creating are all artifacts which means that with your Ursa you will tap for an enormous amount of mana. In the making of this deck tech video, I actually realized I forgot one of my most favorite cards in the entire magic, Gearper Aether Grid. Tap two untapped artifacts you control, deal one damage to target creature or player. This is creature interaction, but also a way to kind of finish the game when you reach it in that enormous board state. All of the attractions are still artifacts, so you're gonna fuel your gear parade grid quite efficiently. And of course, we're gonna have a lot of artifacts in this deck as well, obviously. One I would like to talk a little bit extra about is Torpor Orb. You see, we are fueling opponents' dock sides quite heavily with this deck that's bad. With Torpor Orb, we could shut that down, but also we're stopping Fasas Oracle and Gilded Drake. Or, well, more importantly, Fasas Oracle and Dockside, but Gilded Drake as well. You see, we have a problem with this deck, is that we are very commander centric if we lose our commander it's a very mediocre -ish deck honestly now we do have a bunch of creatures inside this deck with etb effects like dual caster mage gilded drake our own imperial recruiter dockside spell seeker and lord ursa well we don't really care about the lord ursa stuff but we have a lot of etbs here still we're playing torpor orb anyway the reason is very simple that sometimes you're not gonna have your torpor orb or most of the cases your opponents are gonna destroy the torpor orb because they really don't want that to be in play. We like, we can play without these creatures, like if you have them in your hand, just let them sit there until your opponents destroy this and then you can cast your cool creatures and such. But I could see the absolute argument of cutting dual cost the mage and twin flame heat shimmer, that's reducing free cards from the deck, just to keep the torp orb and remove that dual caster torp orb and the synergy. Another awesome stacks card I would like to talk about is Tabernacle at the Pendracle Veil. This is giving an upkeep cost on all creatures. We're gonna have one creature in play usually, that's our commander, and then our opponents are gonna have more. And with Tabernacle we can prevent those creature heavy decks to function properly. Now I know what a lot of you are gonna say, that this is an extremely expensive card and you can't really afford it, it's absolutely out of budget, and I do agree, like you can buy a car or this piece of cardboard. And honestly here, just proxy this and don't think too much about it. But another key component in this deck is the interaction with the counter spells. You see, Myra actually solves the problem of interacting with the counter spells. The big problem with interacting with counter spells is that you're losing hand size against your free opponents. Sure, you're trading equally with the person that you're interacting with. Let's say someone is costing a Let's go Rhystic Study or not Nauseam and you cast a Delay or an Archmage Charm or any form of Mana Drain or a Counterspell on that, both of you trade equally. But the other two opponents are not that affected. So in the long run, once you're starting to interact with all three opponents a little bit here and there, casting Counterspell there, casting Counterspell there, casting Counterspell there, they're pretty much unaffected in their hand size but you're shrinking quite heavily. But here's where Myra solves that problem by Whenever you cast that interaction, that counterspell, you're creating that attraction, and that attraction can sometimes give you value. But once you start to imprint spells into your attraction and you get hits on those attractions, that's where you're getting real value. So Archmage Charm is a great example of a great card here. Free blue mana, that's annoying, but well, we're only on red and blue, so that shouldn't be a problem. Counter target spell, that's great, that's gonna prevent people from winning the match with scary scary stuff well it's free mana so it's rather expensive but here's the cool part when you have it in your graveyard you can imprint it into one of your attractions and whenever you hit this you can draw two cards or steal something on cmc1 from one of your opponents 
Same with Red Elemental Blast and Pyroblast, and Pyroblast just happens to be not in this deck. I think I'm gonna cast Misdirection for it, but let's carry on. You can counter a blue spell or destroy target blue permanent. So this is creating counter wars when you wanna make sure that your opponent doesn't win. But then if you imprint it into an attraction, whenever you hit this, you get to destroy a blue commander or blue permanent here and there. So that's also a small value over time. There we go, Pyroblasts in the deck as well. Remove that misdirection. Then we have a little bit of a weird card in here. Pixie Guide, two mana, one, three, fairy flying, grant an adventure. If you would roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus one and ignore the lowest result. This is gonna increase the chance of hitting good results on your attractions, increasing the chance of getting a six or something of the sort. It is honestly a card you can cut. It's like good if you're getting your game plan going and increasing your potential with that game plan, but it's not a great card on its own. You could remove this and add a counter spell if you feel that you want to increase your protection versus fast turbo decks. It's basically if you're playing against a lot of turbo decks, cut this and replace it with a counter spell. If you're playing against a lot of stacks, mid range decks, you should keep this because this is great in a mid range war when people are getting longer turns and more turns in their pod games. But now let's talk a little bit short about how to pilot Myra. Step 1. Advance safe. You want to have an opening hand that is gonna get Myra into play quite efficiently, but also an opening hand that can sometime prevent people from winning fast. Because in CDH, people are usually winning pretty fast, and you're not. Myra is a slow mid-range deck. You can't win fast win slow sadly. Second, don't attract hate towards you. You want to get Myra into play, you want to start building that attraction industry, but you don't want to get interacted with. Now this can be a tricky thing to achieve because sometimes people just hate you, but we need to emphasize the fact that sometimes you need to tell your opponents that you're not the big threat here. There are other turbo ad nauseum decks out there, other fast as oracle console breach strategies, or other crazy fast combos you want to win the game fast, you don't want to win the game fast. So you need to move away hate towards other people sometimes with some politics, or just to be a little careful on how much presence you put onto the battlefield. But then everything flips when you reach the point number three when you become the arch enemy. So in the beginning you need to like develop safely, move hate away from you, but then suddenly you become that big enormous industry and you take over the match and you basically fight Three versus one, everyone versus you, because you have an enormous hard drive capability, an enormous mana production, and you can sit and interact with everyone and slowly grow stronger in a slow ball effect. And then finally, number four, seal the deal. Once you've reached a position where it's very hard to interact with you, you've taken several turns, you've accumulated an enormous hand size, potentially have a lot of counter spells in your hand or stolen a lot of creatures with bribery, and from here at this point, it's very hard to interact with you. Then you go for your combo. Or, well, it kind of depends. You can go for it faster. It depends on how your hand size looks and what you draw into and what the pod looks like. If you look at some opening hands, I actually kind of like this one. You're gonna get your Myra into play turn one with that Lion, Psy Diamond, that Lotus Petal. You're gonna get your Mox Opal into play early as well. So you're gonna keep your Lotus Petal. And you're gonna have mana confluence, you're gonna have Lotus Petal, Myra, and no hand, and you're gonna be in top decking mode. But honestly, this could work. You're like, this could absolutely get there. It's a very risky hand, but it's not bad. Let's draw another one. So here we have a Offer Your Counter Fuse, Torp Orb, Force of Will. So you have protection, but you have a very slow Myra here. You should probably, if this is your first seven, you should probably mulligan this one here. I absolutely love it. We have a Mox Diamond, we have Tabernacle, Mana Vault, Ghostly Pilfer, and Pixie. We don't have any instant sorceries, but we have Ghostly Pilfer that will also draw cards for us. So we can have a turn two, Ghostly Pilfer, and then something like a turn three or something of the sort, Myra, and pa Tabernacle to interact as well. Here's another actually really good hand, turn one, Ancient Tomb, then Arcane Signet, and then you follow up by turn f uh, two, you go Commander, and then turn three, Baral and Ghostly Pilfer, or actually I think you go Ghostly Pilfer and Baral first before Commander because we don't have an instant sorcery. It kind of depends on what we draw into here, but yeah, 
great hand, turn two commander or turn two ghostly pilfer value. Okay, this is absolutely a snap keep again. We have talisman, soul ring, ancient tomb. Yeah, let's deal another one because we already explained. I don't like this hand. You could get stuck. You can have your commander turn one here with lion's eye diamond and one of your islands. But honestly, let's look at another hand. I kinda like it and I also kinda dislike it. You will have your commander into play, you have some cool spells. Or all is pretty nice, but honestly, let's go with another one. I like this, you have Ragavan, you have Arcane Signet, turn one Ragavan, turn two Arcane, and you have a Treasure afterwards. And then you can have a turn three Commander, and you're probably gonna draw into something greatness. You're also gonna have Ottawara, Soaring City, available to you here eventually, because Ragavan and your commander is both legendary. And there, more or less, you get the picture of what we're trying to achieve. Now, if you want to take a look exactly how I put this deck together, as always, link in the description below of the video. But I would like to mention that this is a deck that can be very adaptive. You can build it in a lot of different ways, depending on what you need it to be. So there are cards here that you've seen right now have been going in and out, depending on what I kind of like and dislike. So I don't think you should look at this deck list as a must be this kind of style. It very much depends on how you would like it to be played out and how you want it to be functional. And honestly, I kind of like that. I, I guess that's why I play so many mid-range stacks decks, because they can be very adaptive. They can be changed quite a lot depending on what you need and what you don't need, depending on how your opponents are playing. And this deck is exactly that. You, you can change it so much depending on what you need it to be. And with that, thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Take care guys, I'll see you next time.